If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 51 Idle Chat The abandoned subway system of Gotham stretched out like the city's forgotten veins, a network of desolation beneath the bustling streets. Armed with a flashlight and accompanied by the occasional chittering of my rodent companion Radigan, I descended into the dimly lit abyss, my steps echoing through the forgotten tunnels. Ah, the joys of Gotham's underworld. Not the dreaded sewer level, but close enough, I mumbled, swatting away cobwebs that clung to the fringes of my hoodie. Radigan twitched his whiskers, offering a nonchalant chitter as if to say, could be worse. I shot him a skeptical look. Worse? This place is practically a rodent kingdom. Navigating through the confined dark space, I continued my monologue. No mutant alligators, no killer clowns. Just us and the rats. Fantastic. Radigan's chittering sounded like faint laughter. At least the smell isn't too bad. Small victories, I muttered, my flashlight revealing the graffiti-covered walls and rusty remnants of a bygone era. The distant skittering of rats added an unsettling soundtrack to my solitary expedition. Why did Mr. Freeze have to pick such a charming location for his hideout? I complained, taking an exaggerated step over a puddle that seemed suspiciously murky. Radigan offered a quip, maybe he appreciates the vintage ambience. I sighed. Vintage, sure. Of course, the friggin' rat would appreciate this place. The tunnels twisted and turned, like a labyrinth designed to confound even the most seasoned urban explorers. My flashlight occasionally caught the glint of reflective eyes, the rat populace observing us with mild interest. Radigan emitted an amused chitter, seemingly relishing my response to his furry companions. I shot him a pointed glare. You're thoroughly enjoying this, aren't you? I accused the rat, and received a noncommittal chitter in response. Come to think of it, were you always this talkative? I muttered, scratching my head as the realization dawned that this might be the lengthiest exchange I've had with the cheeky rodent. Radigan typically communicated with me through a series of chitters, and I had to decode them like an enigmatic rodent-based language, using a mix of tone and body language interpretation. But in this weird moment, it was like he upgraded to Rodent Tease 2.0, and suddenly, I understood him almost as clearly as if we were having a conversation in English. So there we were, my rat buddy releasing a sequence of chitters that basically shouted, don't start thinking this is the new normal. This method of chat is downright exhausting. I scratched my head at that cryptic statement. Is it like trying to adapt to your rat form or something? I ventured, and Radigan fired back a chitter that translated to, close enough. Well, at least I was in the ballpark. I couldn't help but chuckle. Out of all the options, why did you settle on being a rat? No offense, but it's not the top choice for many, you know. I probed, always curious about the whole animal transformation deal. Radigan's chitters hummed through the air again, and the translation was, it wasn't my first pick. But considering the circumstances, it was the least threatening, most intelligent living being I could find when I got dragged into this world. Dragged. I mused, scratching my head. So, they pretty much abducted you and dropped you into this world without a by your leave. The thought hadn't crossed my mind until now, but the system must have snatched Radigan from some rat paradise. Here I was, giving him a nose flick completely oblivious to the fact that he might have had a rat family eagerly awaiting his return. Now, I kind of feel like a dick. Radigan surprised me by shaking his head, emitting a series of chitters that roughly translated to, I wasn't dragged here against my will. I was asked, and barely given a moment to answer, so I figured, why not? Well, that was a plot twist. I gave him a questioning look, or at least my best approximation of one. I see, but do you regret it? I probed, genuinely interested in the rodent's perspective. With what seemed like amusement glittering in his beady eyes, Radigan chittered back, No. You're amusing enough, and if things get too dull, I can always bail to the void. I nodded, grasping his rat logic. Return to the void, hey. I echoed, pondering the cosmic musings of a rat philosopher. It'll be kinda lonely without you hitching a ride on my shoulder if you took off someday, but hey, if that's what you want, who am I to stop you? A sigh escaped me, blending with the murmur of the abandoned subway. Radigan's chitters roughly translated to, I won't be leaving any time soon. He then shot me a rat's version of a contempt-filled gaze before unleashing another round of chitters that practically screamed, but who asked for your opinion, anyway? I could feel my brows twitching and an imminent nose flick building up, but my plans came to a halt as my eyes caught sight of a literal crack in the subway wall, 
wide enough for a person to squeeze through. Well, would you look at that, I grinned. Seems like we've struck cold. In the dimly lit confines of his secret hideout, Mr. Freeze stood in front of the cryogenic chamber that housed his beloved wife, Nora. Her serene figure was encased in the glass pod, suspended in a frozen slumber. Victor Freeze, clad in his iconic cryo suit, gazed at her with a mix of tenderness and determination. After a series of heists and painstaking jobs, he had finally amassed enough funds to sustain his research for an entire year. The equipment hummed softly, and the freezing mist enveloped Nora's form as Freeze whispered promises of a cure, his gloved hand reaching out to tenderly caress the cold surface of the cryopod. Another year, my love. I promise, I will find a way to save you, he vowed in a voice that echoed with both anguish and hope. However, the moment of solace was shattered by blaring alarms, abruptly piercing the quiet lair. Freeze's head snapped towards the entrance, his eyes filled with a mix of anguish and rage. Why? He coldly growled. Why can't they leave me and my beloved alone? His hands clenched into fists, Freeze retrieved his cryo gun from its resting place. The blue glow of the weapon cast an eerie light on his determined expression. With a final, sorrowful glance at Nora, he marched towards the entrance, ready to confront the intruders who dared to disrupt the fragile sanctuary he had built for the woman he loved. Sneaking through the concealed entrance, I found myself in Mr. Freeze's hidden lair a sealed sanctuary that didn't bother showing up on any map. The atmosphere was chilly enough to make your teeth chatter, and high-tech gadgetry adorned the place, giving off a sci-fi vibe. Dim blue lights cast an otherworldly glow, and cryogenic chambers were scattered like silent sentinels. The hum of machinery and the mysterious mist hanging in the air created an unsettling ambience, emphasizing the seriousness of Freeze's quest. As I navigated cautiously, every step seemed to echo in the cold, metallic space. The walls were lined with strange contraptions, their purpose known only to the frozen genius himself. It was like wandering through the set of a high-budget, frosty thriller. Amidst the advanced technology, I felt a sudden drop in temperature, and the lair transformed into an icy maze. Blue lasers crisscrossed the area, adding a layer of complexity to my exploration. Navigating through them, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was an unwelcome guest in Frieza's personal domain, which I probably was to be fair. The heart of the lair revealed itself, and the air turned bone-chilling. The floor was frosted over, and the gadgets seemed to pulse with a life of their own. Just as I thought I had a grip on the surroundings, an unexpected deep freeze caught me off guard. Ice encased my lower body, and before I could react, the man himself appeared. Mr. Freeze stood tall, his cryo gun at the ready, and pointed straight at me. You're not supposed to be here, he stated, his tone a mixture of frustration and rage. Chapter 52, That's Cold Radigan made a dramatic exit from my shoulder, giving Mr. Freeze a look that screamed, I'll nibble your nose off. I had to quickly play mediator. Easy there, Radigan. We're uninvited guests it's only natural we don't get a warm welcome, I chuckled, trying to soothe both the frosty scientist and the cheeky rat. Strangely enough, my guardian veil's magic shield kept me cozy, and I didn't feel the cold, but my legs, but I couldn't move my legs an inch. Oh, well. That's another weakness to note for my barrier, I guess. Facing Mr. Freeze, I raised my hands, aiming for non-threatening surrender. Hey, Dr. Fries, I'm not here to start trouble, I assured him. The cryo gun wavered a bit but stayed pointed in my general direction. Who are you? And how did you find me here? He inquired with suspicion, giving me the once over. The name's Micah Foster. As for the how, it doesn't matter and it's better left unsaid anyway. I quipped, earning a frosty frown. Undeterred, I pressed on. What matters is that I can help you save your wife, Nora, I declared, trying to thaw the situation with a touch of charm. Mr. Freeze let out a cynical scoff. And what do you know about my beloved's condition? He challenged, his voice heavy with frustration. I've been searching for a cure for her illness for years, and I've barely made a dent, he lamented, his icy demeanor betraying a flicker of desperation. I met his gaze with unwavering confidence. I may not have all the answers, but trust me, I've got some impressive tricks up my sleeve, I assured him, trying to inject some optimism into the frosty atmosphere. Tell me what ails her, and I'll whip up a potion or a pill that'll have her dancing in no time, I promised, a grin spreading across my face. What have you got to lose, right? Just give me a shot, I urged, my tone as persuasive as my skills could make it. It wasn't just talk with the system's arsenal at my disposal, 
I could summon up a cure for practically any ailment, provided I had the points for it. Creating a tailored remedy would be far more efficient than a one-size-fits-all approach. Mr. Freeze paused, his gaze piercing. And if it doesn't work? He questioned, his skepticism palpable. My grin widened, undeterred. Trust me, it'll work. But if by some strange twist of fate it doesn't, I've got a backup plan, I reassured him, my confidence unwavering. With a deliberate motion, I raised my arm, the shadows swirling around it like a cloak. As they dissipated, I revealed the father box I'd acquired from the depths of the Black Forest. Behold, the father box apocalyptic tech capable of pulling off some serious miracles, including cellular manipulation, I declared, presenting the device to him like a prized possession. Mr. Freeze's eyes widened in recognition. Nora Fries, his wife, suffered from a rare and incurable form of cancer. It didn't take a genius to see the potential of a device that could tinker with cells at a fundamental level. If you had access to such a miraculous device, why not present it first instead of faking claims of a miracle like a charlatan? Mr. Freeze inquired, both offended and confused. I'm no snake oil salesman, pal, I retorted, shooting him a mildly offended look. I'm confident the medicine I provide would do the trick. But they're a bit on the pricey side, and trust me, I would have preferred to lead with the father box, I explained with a weary sigh. The thing is, I've got no clue how to operate the damn thing, and while cellular manipulation falls under its bag of tricks, it'll probably need some fine-tuning to specifically target and zap those pesky cancer cells, I concluded, rubbing the back of my neck in frustration. I see. Nevertheless, I find the notion of such miraculous cures to be rather ludicrous, Mr. Freeze remarked, his tone tinged with skepticism. I couldn't help but mentally chuckle at his comment. Mr. Freeze, aside from his unwavering dedication to saving his wife, had a reputation for his pride. It made sense that he'd balk at the idea of some stranger conjuring up a cure that could achieve in moments what he'd struggled with for years. The father box, however, is a different story, Mr. Freeze mused, his expression contemplative. Hand it over, and I'll let you leave here with your life, he added, a palpable chill lacing his words. This time, I couldn't stifle the chuckle bubbling up inside me. It doesn't quite work like that, I replied, tightening my grip around the father box until it vanished in a cloud of shadows. If you want to get your hands on that alien gizmo, you'll have to play by my rules, I added, the shadows coalescing around me, shattering the icy encasement around my legs. The cold way it is then, Mr. Freeze declared, leveling his cryogun at me and unleashing a freezing blast. I leaped back just in time, narrowly avoiding the icy tendrils that encroached on the ground where I had stood moments ago. Cold puns, really. I muttered under my breath with a chuckle, though I paused as I caught sight of Radigan, poised to lunge at Mr. Freeze. Stay out of this one, Radigan. Let me give Dr. Fry's a lesson in manners no one else has dared to deliver, I instructed the feisty rodent, cracking my knuckles in anticipation. Less than five minutes later, I found myself chuckling at the sight of Mr. Freeze kneeling on the ground, frustration etched into every line of his face. Our showdown was far from legendary, to say the least. Sure, his cryogun and ice grenades were annoying as heck, and he wielded them with calculated precision, but that was about it. Meanwhile, I had an invisible barrier, strength that bordered on superhuman, powers to manipulate shadows, and a boot that made me feel like the Flash's distant cousin from the clearance aisle. He did manage to slow me down a bit with his ice-covered ground, the classic move against any wannabe speedster, though I'll admit calling myself a speedster is a bit of a stretch. But even without the super speed, I had enough tricks up my sleeve to keep him guessing. In the end, a few well-placed hits were all it took to damage his suit, and he crumbled to the ground, unable to continue the fight. You've made your point. Mr. Freeze spat out, his voice dripping with irritation. State your conditions. He ground out his teeth clenched in frustration. I couldn't help but smirk at his begrudging acceptance. See, that wasn't so bad, was it? I quipped, offering him a smile as I approached, extending my hand to help him up. What I want is simple I want you on my team, I clarified, my tone casual yet firm. Mr. Freeze's eyebrows shot up in disbelief. You want me to be your minion? He scoffed, eyeing my outstretched hand warily. And why would I agree to such a ludicrous offer? He countered, his skepticism evident. Who would want you as a minion? I mirrored his scoff, maintaining eye contact. We've already established that I outclass you in combat, I pointed out matter-of-factly. 
and I'm not in the market for a lackey to do my dirty work. No offense, I added, with a shrug. Mr. Freeze regarded me with a suspicious glint in his eyes. Then what exactly are you proposing? He inquired, his tone guarded. Exactly what I said I want you working for me, I reiterated, exhaling audibly. But not in the typical villain lackey kind of way. I'm offering you a legitimate job, I clarified, gesturing toward my extended hand. Mr. Freeze finally relented, grasping my hand firmly as I helped him to his feet. And what job would you have for a wanted criminal such as myself? He inquired, his tone cautious yet curious. I flashed him a broad grin, brimming with confidence. I'm in the process of launching a company, and I've got all the capital lined up, I began, my enthusiasm palpable. And I could certainly use a brilliant mind like yours to spearhead the R&D department, I continued, nodding towards him. Naturally, I'll also help you overhaul your public image and turn over a new leaf. I continued, working my acting and persuasion skills to their utmost limits. I'm definitely not leaving until I have him tied to my carriage. Chapter 53, Buttons, So Many Buttons Walking through the dimly lit subway system, I found myself in surprisingly good spirits, the echoes of my humming bouncing off the damp walls. The rats scurrying around didn't faze me, they were just spectators in this underground theater. Negotiations with Mr. Freeze had gone smoothly, and we had reached an agreement, he'd join my team, and in return, I'd provide him with the means to save his wife. Simple enough, right? Except for the part where he tried to blast me with his cryo gun, but hey, minor details. As I navigated the labyrinthine tunnels, thoughts of boundaries and consequences danced in my mind. Though Freeze wanted me to leave the father box with him, I refused for now. Frankly, I was all for it. I had no clue how to operate the thing, and Freeze was probably the best bet at cracking its secrets. However, his attempt to swipe it from me hadn't set well, and I couldn't let that slide. Boundaries were crucial, especially when dealing with someone as dangerous as Freeze. Emerging into the subway station, ready to ascend to the surface, I froze at the sight before me a figure lurked in the shadows, their silhouette a menacing presence against the flickering lights. The figure, a towering silhouette with unmistakable pointy ears, strategically placed himself in a patch of dim light, casting an imposing shadow. His mask's white lenses gleamed with an eerie intensity. Spotting him, I couldn't resist a smirk. Do you always go for the dramatic lighting, or does it just follow you around for effect? I quipped, my tone laced with amusement. Either way, it feels like you're trying too hard, I added, shaking my head at the absurdity of it all. Unfazed by my attempt at humor, the figure remained stoic. What are you doing here? Batman inquired calmly. I arched an eyebrow, unimpressed. Well, seeing as you're here, lurking in the shadows like the night itself, I'm guessing you followed me and even heard my entire chat with Freeze, I replied matter-of-factly. So, why bother asking? Batman's silent glare attempted to bore into me, but I met it with a grin. The legendary bat stare might intimidate most. However, I wasn't about to be cowed knowing that glaring was all he could do right now. I hadn't done anything wrong, and Batman wouldn't do something as ridiculous as picking a fight with me just for having a conversation with a convicted villain. In the end, Batman seemed to abandon his attempts to intimidate me with his glare. Aren't you a bit too relaxed? He questioned, narrowing his eyes in suspicion. I couldn't help but let out a genuine chuckle at his remark. What else am I supposed to do? Freak out? Run. I retorted. I made sure I wasn't being followed, but this is your turf, after all. I figured you'd have your ways of tracking me down whenever you pleased, I explained with a nonchalant shrug. Besides, I haven't done anything wrong, so why sweat it? In fact, you could say I'm doing you a favor, I added confidently. It might have been a trick of the light or my own imagination, but I could have sworn I saw a hint of a smile tug at the corner of Batman's mouth before it completely disappeared. You lied to the Justice League. You know more than you're letting on, Batman accused, his tone firm. I responded with a simple shrug, neither confirming nor denying his accusation. Follow me, he commanded, turning on his heel and heading toward the subway station's exit. As I watched him stride away, a scoff threatened to escape my lips. Follow him? Like he was the boss of me? But before I could voice my thoughts, Batman halted and spoke up. I'll let you drive the Batmobile, he declared and that was all I needed to hear. Where to, boss? I chimed in with an eager grin. As I took the wheel of the Batmobile, 
the thrill of driving such an iconic vehicle surged through me. My eyes flicked between the road ahead and the array of buttons and dials adorning the dashboard, each one seemingly begging to be pressed. The urge to indulge in some impromptu button-pushing fun was almost overwhelming. But before I could give in to temptation, I felt the weight of Batman's gaze boring into me from the passenger seat. His stern expression warned me against any rash actions, and I couldn't help but swallow the impulse to start randomly pressing buttons like a kid in a candy store. With a reluctant sigh, I focused my attention back on the road, resisting the magnetic pull of the Batmobile's controls. After all, I was a guest here, and it wouldn't do to upset the dark night with any unnecessary antics. So, I settled for enjoying the exhilarating drive through the outskirts of Gotham, content to savor the experience without causing any unnecessary trouble while following the GPS coordinates Batman had placed. The journey was as quiet as a graveyard at midnight. Any attempts I made to spark a conversation were met with nothing more than monosyllabic responses from Batman, who seemed determined to maintain his air of mystery. It was like trying to talk to a brick wall, albeit a highly intimidating one. Despite the eerie silence and the nagging feeling of being led into the unknown, I couldn't help but find a certain thrill in the situation. After all, how many people could boast about driving around Gotham City in the Batmobile? It was the stuff of dreams, or at least, the kind of thing you'd expect to see in a comic book. Sure, some might have called it a classic case of stranger danger, but as an orphan who grew up in the warm confines of the foster system, I never received the memo about avoiding suspicious strangers' vehicles. Besides, this was Batman we were talking about, not some mustachioed creep offering candy from a van. As we drew closer to our destination, the landscape began to change, transitioning from the familiar cityscape of Gotham to a more rugged and remote area. The GPS coordinates guided us onto an off-road path, winding through dense foliage until we reached the foot of a towering cliff, its surface cloaked in greenery and moss. With a practiced ease, Batman retrieved a sleek remote control device from the depths of his utility belt. As he aimed it at the cliff face and pressed a button, the rugged stone parted like an automatic garage door, revealing a hidden passage carved into the heart of the cliff. My eyes widened in disbelief as I recognized where we were headed. This is... I muttered under my breath, momentarily stunned by the revelation. I quickly composed myself, attempting to conceal my expression, but it was clear that Batman had noticed my reaction. So you do know. His voice was laced with a hint of suspicion as if he had finally confirmed a long-standing suspicion. Caught off guard, I could only offer a sheepish shrug in response as I guided the Batmobile through the opening, descending into the depths of the Batcave. Standing within the expansive confines of the Batcave, Alfred Pennyworth wore his customary smile as he observed the Batmobile gliding to a halt, its engines humming to a gentle stop. Tray in hand, laden with refreshments and snacks, and with a towel draped over his arm, he approached the driver's seat, ready to greet his employer. I'm pleasantly surprised. You've returned early today, Master B.R. Alfred's words faltered as the door swung open, revealing not the familiar figure of Bruce Wayne but instead a young man he had never encountered before. Well, I'll be, Alfred remarked, his tone carrying a touch of amusement as he studied the unexpected visitor. A new face in the Batmobile. You're not the usual clientele, are you? The young man met Alfred's gaze with a wry grin. Sorry to disappoint, but I'm not here for the snacks, though they do look tempting, so I'll accept your generosity, he said, snatching two cookies, one for himself, the other for the royally dressed rat atop his shoulder. Alfred arched an eyebrow, his curiosity piqued. And just who might you be, then? The visitor's grin widened. Let's just say I'm a friend of the bat, here to lend a hand, or a paw, if you will, he said, prompting the rat to wave at the butler. Alfred's confusion deepened, but before he could voice his inquiries, Batman emerged from the passenger seat, cutting through the tension with his presence. Alfred, this is Micah, Batman introduced, his voice carrying a hint of approval. I brought him here to discuss something important. Alfred's gaze flickered between Micah and Batman, his expression a mix of amusement and intrigue. Well, well. It seems I have much to catch up on. Welcome to the Batcave, young man. Chapter 54, The World's Greatest Detective Balancing the tray of refreshments with practiced ease, Alfred placed it carefully on the table, his composed demeanor barely masking his inner perplexity. I suppose I should have sensed trouble brewing when Master Wayne decided to return ahead of schedule, he murmured under his breath, earning a sharp glance from Batman. What's that, Alfred? Batman's voice was firm, his gaze probing. Alfred offered a polite smile. Merely my own musings 
sir. Nothing of consequence, he replied, stepping back after arranging the table to perfection. Feel free to engage in your discussion. I shall remain close by, he added, positioning himself discreetly behind Batman, his curiosity barely contained. As Batman and his unexpected guest settled into conversation, Alfred couldn't shake the nagging sense of bewilderment. He had been prepared to go to great lengths to protect his employer's secret identity, even entertaining the notion of impersonating Batman himself if need be. However, the unexpected turn of events had caught him off guard, leaving him grappling with a mystery he was determined to unravel. Batman cast a lingering glance at Alfred, who remained steadfast in his position, showing no signs of leaving. With a resigned shake of his head, Batman proceeded to remove his cowl, much to Alfred's evident horror. Micah, however, reacted with a mere sigh, his expression reflecting a resigned acceptance of the unfolding situation. You've dispensed with the charade entirely now. Bruce Wayne, now unmasked, remarked with a hint of amusement, his lips curling into a wry smile. Micah, unfazed, responded with a bitter smile of his own. You wouldn't have brought me here if you weren't convinced I already knew your secret, he stated with a shake of his head. I'd like to know what makes you so sure, though, he continued, his tone tinged with curiosity. You seem to know far more than I anticipated, Bruce admitted, his surprise evident. He had harbored doubts before, but the level of insight displayed by the young man standing before him suggested a deeper understanding and understanding that extended beyond mere knowledge of his secret identity to the intricacies of his thoughts and actions, closely guarded secrets that he had never imagined would be laid bare. Micah's demeanor in his exchanges with Bruce appeared almost unervingly strategic, as if he possessed an uncanny knack for navigating their brief interactions with calculated precision. He seemed to know exactly when to stand his ground and when to yield, pushing Bruce's patience to its limits before easing off at just the right moment. But that wasn't all. To answer your question, it's through keen observation that I'm certain, Bruce affirmed, his tone unwavering. I've dissected your interrogation at the watchtower multiple times, and that was the first tell. He elaborated. The way you deflected Hal's probing about your knowledge of the future, deliberately baiting and provoking him to divert focus, he continued. Micah, unimpressed, crossed his arms. That could have been mere coincidence, you know? Not everyone responds to yes or no questions with a straightforward yes or no answers, he countered, fixing Bruce with an incredulous gaze. Bruce nodded in agreement. Indeed, but as I've mentioned, that was merely the beginning. He elucidated. Take your encounter with Ted Grant, for instance, and how your demeanor shifted the moment you learned his name, almost as if you were privy to more information, he continued. Micah scoffed dramatically. Well, of course, I'd change my attitude. Ted Grant is a world-renowned boxing champion, and I went to his gym with the intention of picking up some fighting skills, he retorted, waving his hand dismissively. Bruce shook his head. But there was more to it, wasn't there? You readily acknowledged his association with Batman and even speculated about his connection to Ted Cord, another Justice League member. He elaborated. If that doesn't suggest knowledge of his secret identity, then what does? He pressed. Micah met his gaze with a challenging look, undeterred. Even so, that merely suggests awareness of Cord and Grant's alter egos, it doesn't necessarily imply knowledge of your own, he countered defiantly. No, but your manner of interaction does. Though our encounters have been few, you seem to possess an innate understanding of how to navigate our world and its inhabitants, Bruce calmly asserted. As a stranger with an undisclosed agenda, I should naturally harbor suspicion toward you. Yet, you've managed to earn my respect with mere words, he added, offering a faint smile. Bruce nodded, as if to affirm his own observation. Indeed, your adeptness at maneuvering through delicate situations has not gone unnoticed, he concurred. Your deal with Superman, the proposition you presented regarding Livewire, and the words you spoke to Victor Jaws to make him let go of the hostage in the asylum all these instances hint at a deeper understanding, he elaborated. He proceeded to methodically unveil the various clues he had pieced together, including Micah's expedition to the Black Forest and his encounter with the Penguin. Standing by and listening to Bruce's revelations, Alfred's eyes widened with each new detail. Micah, meanwhile, wore an expression of profound exasperation, while Radigan perched on his shoulder, seemingly unfazed and indulging in a biscuit. Once Bruce finished recounting his deductions, Micah mustered a bitter smile. I knew you'd keep tabs on me, but I didn't anticipate it to be this thorough, he remarked with a sigh. I expected you'd catch on eventually, but I didn't imagine it would be this soon, he added, 
reclining in his seat with a defeated air, as though resigned to the inevitability of the situation. As expected of the Dark Knight of Gotham, I suppose. Your penchant for paranoia never fails to impress, he concluded, offering a genuine smile as he met Bruce's gaze once more. In the dimly lit Batcave, a peculiar glimmer shone in Micah's eyes. Despite the unraveling of his meticulously crafted schemes to conceal his knowledge of the future for as long as possible, there was no hint of irritation or frustration. Instead, a genuine sense of delight illuminated his features. Gone was his customary playful smirk, replaced by a smile brimming with unadulterated joy. In this moment, Micah bore a striking resemblance to a white-eyed child beholding their lifelong hero, devoid of his usual obstinate pride and sharp-witted sarcasm that defined his existence. The fleeting moment of genuine delight on Micah's face quickly gave way to his customary smirk. I'll concede this round, but... He trailed off, grin widening. How do you suppose I came by all this knowledge? I'm eager to hear your deductions, he prompted. Bruce returned the smile, his eyes gleaming with intrigue. That question stumped me for quite some time, he admitted. While I could attribute your knowledge of a few future events and a handful of secret identities to your involvement with the League in your former world, there's more to it than that, he mused. I've fought crime for years, been part of the League, and known its members for quite some time, yet even I lack intimate knowledge of the personalities of so many extraordinary individuals, Bruce explained. Micah nodded in agreement, his expression thoughtful. That tracks, he remarked acknowledging Bruce's deductions. Bruce pressed on, undeterred by the interruption. The Justice League in your world might operate under a different set of rules, where identities are public knowledge. That could explain your knowledge of our identities, Bruce reasoned. But it doesn't quite cover how you seem to know every little detail about both heroes and villains. Bruce's expression turned slightly more severe. You said the Justice League exists in your world, and I don't doubt it, but existence has many forms. He stated. The form of the League's existence in your original world is the only thing that could explain your knowledge. Micah's expression shifted again at Bruce's words, a spark of excitement lighting up his eyes. So, how do you think the Justice League exists in my world? He inquired, his interest barely contained. Bruce considered for a moment, his brow furrowing in concentration. It's just a theory, but in your world, maybe the Justice League exists as fiction. Widely known, accessible to everyone even regular civilians like you, he theorized. Micah's shrug was nonchalant, yet there was a spark of challenge in his eyes. Could be. But here's the kicker I'm not your average Joe, he retorted, conjuring a shadow blade into his palm as if to emphasize his point. It's not beyond the realm of possibility for a powered individual to gather such intel, is it? Micah questioned, his gaze locking with Bruce's while the latter remained unfazed, shaking his head calmly. I may not know how you attained those powers, but one thing is for certain, Bruce asserted with conviction. When you first arrived here, you were entirely ordinary. He paused, emphasizing his point. Hal confirmed it after scanning you with his power ring. Apart from the peculiar footwear you are currently sporting, there was no trace of any extraordinary abilities. Bruce's demeanor exuded confidence as he continued, his words carrying weight. Superman even verified that you didn't possess those shoes when you initially appeared in our world. Chapter 55, Unbiased Listening to Bruce's words, I struggled to contain the grin threatening to split my face in half. It was like watching a master chess player reveal his moves one by one. Sure, I knew about his detective skills from reading the comics, but witnessing it in person was a whole new level of awe-inspiring. Since my first encounter with Superman in this world, I'd managed to keep my inner fanboy in check. But right now, as Bruce laid out his deductions, it took all my acting skills to maintain a facade of calm. What self-respecting comics fan wouldn't geek out over being analyzed by the one and only Dark Knight? I had to hand it to him. The resources it must have taken to keep tabs on me was one thing. However, Bruce's ability to connect the dots, from the trivial detail of me arriving without shoes to my banter with Hal Jordan, was both impressive and downright terrifying. This was Batman we were talking about the world's greatest detective and one of the sharpest minds around. And it doesn't bother you? I asked, my intrigue bubbling over. The fact that we might just be characters in someone else's story. I added, unable to resist poking the bear of existentialism. Not in the slightest, Bruce replied, his voice steady as ever. In a universe as vast as ours, it wouldn't be surprising if there were worlds where we all exist as nothing more than literary creations, he mused, his tone thoughtful. Even if that were the case, 
it wouldn't change a thing for me. My purpose remains unchanged to uphold justice and do what's right, Bruce concluded, his conviction unwavering. I couldn't help but nod in agreement. Those words resonated with me deeply. The notion had crossed my mind once or twice since landing in this topsy-turvy world. What if I was just a figment of someone's imagination? What if my entire existence was nothing more than ink on a page or pixels on a screen? But dwelling on such thoughts was as pointless as trying to herd cats. The truth was, it didn't matter. Whether real or fictional, my purpose remained the same, to make the most of every moment, to seize every opportunity, and to enjoy the wild ride that life or fiction threw my way. As long as I was having fun, the rest was just background noise. My laughter echoed through the Batcave, drawing quizzical glances from both Alfred and Bruce. Sorry, guys, but this is just too surreal, I managed between chuckles. It's like stepping into a dream, but one that's a perfect match for reality. The genuine joy bubbling inside me refused to be contained as I continued, I mean, come on, it's like I'm a kid all over. I grinned, feeling the thrill of the moment coursing through me. Alfred's amusement was evident in the crinkle of his eyes as he quipped, so, I gather you were quite the fan of Master Bruce in your previous world. I couldn't help but nod enthusiastically. Absolutely, a huge fan of both of you, I admitted, not bothering to keep up the act. Oh? Could it be that I was also included in these works of fiction from your world? Alfred asked, sounding genuinely intrigued. Not only were you just included, but you were a fan favorite. Some folks even preferred you over your employer and all the Robins no offense, Bruce, I added with a playful wink in his direction. Alfred's chuckle resonated through the Batcave, his eyes twinkling with amusement. Well, it seems the people of your world have quite the refined taste, he remarked, nodding with satisfaction. His curiosity was evident, but Bruce's timely interruption shifted the focus back to the matter at hand. Now that that's settled, let's get to the crux of why you're here, Bruce announced, his tone sobering, and I mirrored his serious expression, eager to hear his proposal. To put it simply, I want to assist you in your endeavors, he stated calmly, his gaze steady. Perplexed, I raised an eyebrow. And what, pray tell, are my endeavors? I inquired, genuinely intrigued by his offer. Bruce remained composed. The rehabilitation of criminals like Livewire and Mr. Freeze, he replied matter-of-factly. I let out a sigh at his assumption. Is that what you think I'm up to? I questioned, meeting his gaze head-on and he merely crossed his arms, his expression unreadable. W.E.L. I can't say it didn't cross my mind. But it's easier said than done, you know. I admitted with a sigh. Livewire's case was a case of the stars aligning, and Mr. Freeze could easily redeem himself in society's eyes with his medical expertise. But not everyone is as receptive as them or eager to change their ways, I explained, voicing my reservations. Bruce's smile widened at my candor. Are you saying it's an impossible task? He inquired, the challenge clear in his tone. I shook my head. Not impossible, but nearly so. The resources and time needed to expand these efforts beyond two cases is not something I have, I confessed. Bruce's smile remained unwavering. And what if I were to provide the necessary resources and facilities? He proposed, his offer hanging in the air. I furrowed my brow at Bruce's proposal. What exactly are you getting at? I inquired, a hint of skepticism creeping into my voice. A fully functional rehab center, complete with all the necessary licenses and legal requirements, he explained calmly. Under your guidance, you'll have the freedom to handpick the psychologists if you want. I couldn't help but let out a chuckle at his suggestion. So, another nuthouse. I quipped, shaking my head at the thought. You know as well as I do that mere shrinks can't cure the kind of crazy some of these folks have. But you can can't you? Most super criminals are driven by obsession, Bruce countered. You've cracked the codes of Livewire and Mr. Freeze, offering alternatives that don't involve breaking the law. Just keep doing what you've been doing, and as for me, I'll grease the wheels to ensure any reformed baddies get a second chance, he concluded, his resolve shining through in his words. I'll set it up so individuals like Mr. Freeze can work even while they're behind bars, giving them a chance to earn their freedom. You know what that means, right? Bruce's confidence rang through his words, his eyes piercing. Once again, I found myself taken aback. You do realize I've gone through all this trouble to reform Mr. Freeze and Livewire just to capitalize on their talents and line my pockets. I blurted out, 
my frustration clear. Bruce remained composed. Even so, if they're out of the criminal game and living honest lives, it's more than anyone else, including the League and myself, could do for them, he reasoned. At the end of the day, people rely on each other. It's not necessarily a bad thing. If you lend a hand and receive assistance in return, who's to say it's wrong? He mused. I suppose that's just how society rolls, I admitted with a nod. But why come to me with this? Why not take on the task yourself? I questioned, genuinely curious. While I might have a deep understanding of Gotham's criminals, I could never reach them as effectively as you could, Bruce expressed, a hint of frustration coloring his tone. It's theoretically possible, but practically unfeasible. I've been locked in battle with them for too long. They'd never accept my help, no matter how many times I offer it, he lamented. I've made attempts to reform them before, but over time, I've developed a sort of bias against them that would hinder any genuine connection, Bruce continued. But you, you possess a deep understanding of their motives and personalities with none of the prejudice. I can see it in the way you handled Harley Quinn and the Riddler, Bruce stated, his voice unwavering. You didn't show an ounce of fear, disgust, or judgment toward them toward them. You simply showed interest in them and they reciprocated, they sensed your sincerity, he explained. You, an outsider with no biases against these criminals, are the ideal candidate for the job, he concluded, his gaze steady and resolute. Do you even realize the amount of trust you're putting in me? I questioned, torn between amusement and concern. Have you thought about the consequences if I decide I no longer want to cooperate? I pressed further. I have, Bruce responded firmly. But ultimately, this is the only path I see to break the ceaseless cycle of conflict between heroes and villains, he declared. If you prove to be untrustworthy, then I'll have to shoulder the responsibility and stop you myself, he concluded, his resolve unwavering. Chapter 56, Alarm Clock Ninja Lying on my bed in my New York apartment, I couldn't tear my eyes away from the glowing text box floating before me. The Daily Deals tab beckoned with a tempting offer, a weapon master skill at a jaw-dropping 90% discount, priced at a mere 800 points. My stash of points had swelled to a comfortable 2,150 a significant jump from the measly 530 I'd been left with after splurging on the permanent mental shield. Sure, I'd snagged some points from Mr. Freeze, Batman, finally, the Penguin, and even Alfred, but those gains alone couldn't explain the sudden windfall. The truth lay in the barrage of notifications flooding my inbox, announcing shifts in my relationship statuses from, neutral, to either, curious, or, cautious, with unknown individuals. The mysterious messages read like this, your relationship with, has shifted from, neutral, to, cautious. It wasn't my first rodeo with such notifications, they'd only cropped up previously when Wildcat caught sight of me in a dark alley, unbeknownst to me. Clearly, word about me was getting around. It was a double-edged sword, leaving me simultaneously thrilled for the influx of points and apprehensive for obvious reasons. Who were these new players in my game? and what nefarious plans might they have in store for me. Find that out and more in the next episode. Just kidding. Who cares really? I chuckled to myself, shaking off any lingering concerns. Word about me spreading was inevitable, and whoever harbored nefarious plans, well, they'd have to catch me first. Besides, flying by the seat of my pants always made for a more exhilarating ride. With a nonchalant shrug, I redirected my focus to the Daily Deals section, my cursor hovering over the coveted Weapon Master skill. Without a moment's hesitation, I clicked Purchase and sealed the deal. The description flashed before me, Weapon Master, transform into the ultimate weapon-wielding virtuoso. Whether it's a baguette or a rubber chicken, you'll wield it like a pro, leaving villains quaking in their boots and bystanders questioning their life choices. With this skill, even a feather duster becomes a deadly weapon of mass dust destruction. So, Grab your spatula and prepare to flip your enemies upside down with unparalleled finesse. Ah, the perks of modern-day online shopping, I mused, already envisioning the endless possibilities this newfound skill would unlock. The promise of the skill's description was enough to push me into buying it without a second thought. I mean, who wouldn't want to become a master of anything that could double as a weapon? I'd be lying if I said I wasn't tempted by the idea of going all Jackie Chan on my enemies but more importantly, this skill seemed like the perfect solution to my lack of combat finesse, especially after getting my butt handed to me by the Riddler back in the asylum. Of course, enhancing my shadow powers was a big plus, but what really sold me was the versatility. 
I mean, think about it almost anything can be used as a weapon if you get creative enough. A car? That's a weapon if you are willing to go full Mad Max. The same goes for a plane or a boat. Put simply, with this skill, I could channel my inner NASCAR driver if I ever decided to weaponize a car. And it didn't stop there this mastery extended to anything and everything, from conventional weapons to everyday objects like furniture. Picture this, me, wielding a chair like a pro A&D. Okay, maybe there aren't many practical applications for wielding a chair outside of combat, so maybe that wasn't the most convincing example, but you catch my drift. The possibilities with this skill were practically endless. Who knows? Maybe I'll be the first person in history to beat someone within an inch of their life using a baguette. Hey, stranger things have happened in my life lately. All right. I grumbled, rolling off my bed with all the grace of a sloth on a Monday morning. Let's give this a whirl. I announced to my rat, Radigan, who seemed more interested in his own fur than my impromptu swordplay. His beady eyes, however, perked up at my words, fixed on me like he was expecting a show. Watch closely, rat. I exclaimed, extending my hand and conjuring a shadowy sword in my right palm. With my left, I grabbed an alarm clock from my bedside table and flung it into the air like I was auditioning for a bizarre circus act. As I mentally prepared to slice the annoying clock in two, my brain felt like it was doing backflips in a pool of information. My hand moved with a mind of its own, adjusting to grip the shadowy blade like I was born with it. Then, channeling my inner sword saint or maybe just my alarm clock ninja I flipped the blade and sliced upward faster than a cat chasing a laser pointer. Blink and you'd miss it. In a matter of milliseconds, the once whole alarm clock was now lying on the ground in two perfect halves. My eyes widened in disbelief as I stared at the sliced clock, feeling like I'd stumbled into a cheesy action movie. Well, would you look at that, I muttered to myself, half expecting applause from an invisible audience, and it did come, but from the cheeky rodent, spectating my antics like a king watching his personal jester. Though everything happened unconsciously and in the blink of an eye, I managed to temper my strength, and the result was nothing short of astonishing. Testing the limits of this newfound skill would have to wait for another day. But enough about that for now. I'm sure you're eager to hear about my deal with Bruce, and here I am rambling on about my latest power-up. Annoying, right? Anyway, let's address the elephant in the room, I turned down Bruce's offer. Before you grab your torches and pitchforks, let me explain. The idea of running a mental asylum under my direction was undeniably tempting. I could have folks like Mr. Freeze working for me even while locked up, and have the doctors vouch for their rehabilitation. But truth be told, it felt like too much hassle and a massive time sink for a guy who just wanted to enjoy life like me. Naturally, I didn't spill the beans about my desire to simply goof off and have fun I'm not that thick-skinned. Instead, I diplomatically told Bruce it was a hefty responsibility and not quite aligned with my life goals at the moment. But Bruce, stubborn as ever, wasn't having any of it. He insisted I wouldn't need to do anything extra, just carry on with my usual antics. Upon hearing Bruce's proposal, I instinctively fell back on my ultimate weapon, my stubborn pride. I made it clear to Bruce that while the idea was enticing, I wasn't keen on everything being handed to me on a silver platter. I'd always been accustomed to earning my keep, and being given so much help didn't sit right with me. It might have been foolish and stubborn, but that's just the kind of person I am. Back in my old world, I lived by relying on myself, and I intended to do the same here. Bruce seemed perturbed by my refusal but he wasn't one to give up easily. He suggested that he proceed with the construction and legalities of the establishment, and once everything was set up and ready to go, I could simply buy it from him and take over. With that proposition, I found myself running out of reasons to say no, so I reluctantly agreed. But before sealing the deal, I laid down a few conditions. The first condition caught Bruce off guard, I insisted that the asylum be built in New York instead of Gotham. Naturally, Bruce was intrigued and questioned my choice. That's when I dropped the bombshell on him the revelation that Gotham was cursed, thanks to some ancient warlock buried beneath the city. Let me tell you, his reaction was priceless. As Bruce's face went from aha to oh in record time, I couldn't help but smirk at the sheer roller coaster of emotions playing out before me. But it wasn't until I dropped the bombshell about Arxum Asylum possibly being on a spiritual hotspot that his eyes nearly popped out of his head. With Bruce finally on board, I laid out the rest of my terms, and surprisingly, he was all ears. After sealing the deal, I bid adieu to the Batcave, leaving Bruce with a parting gift of sorts a recommendation to call in the big guns like Constantine or maybe even Spawn, 
if he existed in this world, to tackle Gotham's curses. And that, my friends, is how the cookie crumbled. The whole situation felt like a bizarre role reversal. Normally, I'd be the one flaunting my knowledge and dangling tempting offers to get others on board with my plans. But there I was, turning down Bruce's proposition and calling the shots for once, only to be convinced by him in the end. It was a strange twist of fate, but hey, I wasn't complaining. It was kind of refreshing to be on the other side of the negotiation table for once. Chapter 57, Brother Blood As the thunderous blasts reverberated through the apartment, I groggily pried my eyes open, irritation edged across my face. With a reluctant groan, I reached for my phone, squinting at the glaring screen that announced an ungodly hour, five in the morning. Cursing under my breath, I couldn't help but curse, who in the hell is setting off fireworks at this ungodly hour? Tossing the phone aside, I grabbed a nearby pillow and attempted to muffle the cacophony, hoping to salvage what little sleep I had left. But the explosions persisted, growing louder and more persistent by the second. Just as I was about to surrender to frustration, Radigan, my faithful rodent companion, leaped onto the bed, snatching the pillow away and nudging me insistently. I shot Radigan an exasperated glare, but his persistent antics left me with no choice but to begrudgingly surrender to the inevitable. With a resigned sigh, I clambered out of bed, muttering darkly under my breath. Whoever's behind this is in for a world of hurt, I grumbled, peering out the window to catch a glimpse of the fiery glow in the distance. But first, coffee, I declared with a weary yawn, trudging toward the kitchen in search of the life-saving elixir that would fuel my morning. It had been a week since I splurged on the weapon master skill, and surprisingly, things had been calm. Bruce checked in occasionally, mostly to hash out the details of the asylum, or rather rehab center, as I insisted on calling it. Beyond that, life had settled into a comfortable routine. My daily visits to Wildcat had taken on a new flavor, no longer just for training, they had morphed into regular social calls. As it turned out, fists were fair game under the effects of the weapon master skill. The look on Wildcat's face when I handed him his ass in a sparring match was absolutely priceless, making the hefty point cost of the skill entirely worth it. Despite the beating I served him, Wildcat remained the only person I could genuinely call a friend, so I made sure to swing by whenever I could. There was also Ted Cord, but he was more of a business partner than a buddy, but undeniably a likable one. Me, making friends who would have thought? Another notable event during this time was my sudden plunge into a gambling frenzy, courtesy of a newly developed addiction. It all started when I found myself drowning in boredom, mindlessly scrolling through the system, when I stumbled upon a tantalizing offer, a random weapon draw for a mere 50 points. The promise of rare and legendary weapons, with a guaranteed rare one after 10 draws, proved too tempting to resist. With my newfound mastery of all weapons, thanks to the weapon master skill, I figured, why not give it a shot? So, I coughed up the points for a single draw, curious to see what fate had in store. The result? A pitifully rusty old spear that looked like it would bend with a firm squeeze. Utterly disappointed, I found myself compelled to try again twenty times over, to be exact. Before I knew it, my points had dwindled to a mere three hundred. Lesson learned, gotchas were the epitome of evil, and I had fallen victim to their siren call. Still, amidst the sea of disappointments, I managed to snag a few decent draws, including an awesome sword. Was it worth it? Perhaps. But mark my words, you'll never catch me indulging in gotcha games ever again. With my coffee drained and my outfit refreshed, I made my way to the door of the apartment. Time to roll, Radigan, I declared, reaching out my hand for him. Without hesitation, he scampered up my arm and settled on my shoulder. I'm about to hand out some well-deserved foot-to-ass deliveries for whoever disturbed my beauty sleep. Brother Blood's maniacal laughter echoed through the chaotic streets as flames danced around him, casting an eerie glow on his skin. His monstrous mount, a grotesque amalgamation of bull and gorilla covered in scales, stomped menacingly, shaking the ground beneath them. With a sinister grin, he reveled in the terror of the civilians, his eyes gleaming with madness. The road to enlightenment is paved with sacrifice. Brother Blood's voice boomed, drowning out the screams of the terrified onlookers. And you shall all be the first to offer yourselves for the greater good. His laughter rang out, a chilling symphony to the destruction surrounding them. But just as his arrogance peaked, a sudden burst of energy sliced through the air, heralding the arrival of Starfire, Beast Boy, and Raven. Their determined expressions contrasted sharply with the chaos, their resolve unwavering as they confronted the malevolent cult leader. 
Starfire, her eyes blazing with determination, unleashed a barrage of searing energy blasts, aiming to disrupt Brother Blood's hold over the creature beneath him. Beast Boy, nimble and agile, transformed into a colossal grizzly bear, charging headlong into the fray, seeking to topple the monstrous mount. Meanwhile, Raven, her cloak billowing ominously around her, focused her telekinetic powers, creating a protective shield around her allies as she prepared to face Brother Blood head-on. Resistance is futile. Surrender now Titans, and I shall sinfully grant you mercy. Brother Blood's taunts fell upon deaf ears as she braced herself, ready to confront the dark sorcerer who sought to manipulate her for his twisted ends. Brother Blood's laughter continued as he clashed with the formidable trio. His acolytes, undeterred by the onslaught, rallied to his side, their fervent zeal fueling their attacks. As the chaos unfolded, the titans found themselves in the thick of battle, their determination unwavering despite the overwhelming number of acolytes against them and the strange weapons they wielded. We need to neutralize those acolytes before they summon more reinforcements. Starfire's voice cut through the din, her eyes ablaze with determination as she launched volleys of energy blasts at the cultists. Beast Boy, his form shifting rapidly to match the ever-changing tide of battle, nodded in agreement. I'll keep M occupied, but we need a plan. He declared, his voice echoing with the ferocity of a bear as he pounced on the nearest adversary. Raven, her expression grim beneath her hood, focused her energies on maintaining the team's defensive barrier. Stick together and focus on rescuing the civilians for now, she commanded, her words carrying the weight of authority as she surveyed the battlefield. Slowly but surely, the Titans gained the advantage as they evacuated the civilians and neutralized the acolytes. However, their efforts were soon met with a sinister twist as Brother Blood unleashed a torrent of dark magic, conjuring a legion of infernal creatures to bolster his ranks. Starfire's eyes widened with alarm at the sight of the approaching horde. Incoming. We need to hold our ground. She shouted, her hands already unleashing another barrage of energy. In his wolf form, Beast Boy let out a frustrated growl as he shifted his attention to the new threat. This is bad. There's too many of them. He exclaimed, his voice tinged with apprehension. Amidst the chaos of battle, Raven took charge, positioning herself between her comrades and the encroaching infernal creatures. Stand behind me. She commanded her voice ringing out with authority as she conjured a protective barrier of dark energy. I'll send these creatures back to where they belong. Her eyes blazed with power as she focused her energy, preparing to unleash a formidable banishment spell. Azeroth Metrian Zinthos. With a resounding cry, Raven channeled her magic, weaving intricate incantations as dark vortex-like portals materialized beneath the feet of the infernal creatures. One by one, they were drawn into the abyss, vanishing from sight as they were returned to their original dimensions. Relief washed over Raven as the last of the creatures disappeared, but her victory was short-lived. In a swift and unexpected maneuver, Brother Blood seized his opportunity, ensnaring Raven with tendrils of dark magic before she could react. Helpless to intervene, Beast Boy and Starfire found themselves locked in combat with the remaining acolytes and Brother Blood's mount, unable to come to Raven's aid. Brother Blood, his grin twisted with malice, materialized behind Raven, his form shifting into a menacing cloud of blood mist as he hoisted her onto his shoulder. Foolish girl, he taunted, his voice dripping with contempt. Did you truly believe you could evade the grasp of Trigon? With a sinister flourish, he conjured a swirling portal of blood-red energy. You refused to embrace the darkness, and now you shall be consumed by it you and the entire world, he stated, poised to make his escape. Before Brother Blood could make his grand escape, he felt an unexpected shift in gravity. Confusion furrowed his brow as he glanced over his shoulder, only to discover an empty space where Raven once perched. Panic clawed at his chest as he scanned the chaotic scene, desperate to locate her. To his astonishment, he found her suspended in the air, ensnared by a dark tendril, inching toward a figure shrouded in swirling shadows. Micah's face emerged from the darkness, his gaze piercing through the gloom as he intercepted Raven's descent. With effortless grace, he ripped through the binding magic, freeing her from its grasp. A smirk danced across his lips as he locked eyes with Brother Blood. Seriously, dude, you need to grow up and get over the edgy phase you got going on, Micah chided, his tone dripping with mock disappointment like a parent talking down to his child. You're pushing 50, and you're still spouting this embrace the darkness Vader type shit like a teenage Sith wannabe? Come on, man, show some shame and act your age. He shook his head, a mix of exasperation and amusement evident in his demeanor. Chapter 58, New Toy Observing Raven shoot me a look that screamed, 
stranger danger alert, I barely stifled a laugh. I can't blame her, not everyone would readily trust a shadow-drenched stranger swooping in to save the day. But, hey, I simply have to set the record straight, right? Ease up on the suspicious stare, I quipped, raising an eyebrow. I'm not gonna offer you candy. Plus, I don't even own a sketchy van, you know. I added, letting out a chuckle at the absurdity of the situation. Raven seemed to have a quip on the tip of her tongue, but before she could muster a comeback, Brother Blood crashed the party with all the subtlety of a bull in a china shop, pointing his finger at me like an inquisitor pointing out a witch in a crowd of peasants. And who in Trigon's name are you to hinder the Church of Blood's unholy crusade? He thundered, his rage palpable. Grinning like a Cheshire cat, I volleyed back with equal zeal. Didn't your parents teach you manners? Introduce yourself before you ask others for their names. I retorted, relishing the confusion that flickered across Brother Blood's face. I killed my... He replied, pausing halfway as his bewilderment quickly morphed into a fresh wave of realization and fury. Impudent child! You dare mock Brother Blood! Dark tendrils of magic began to coil around him like a sinister aura. Shouldn't it be Grandpa Blood now, you edgy old-timer? I fired back with a smirk, delighting in the gasps of disbelief from his entourage of acolytes. Very well. If you're so eager for death, then I shall grant your wish. With a scowl, Brother Blood hurled a swirling ball of dark energy, looking like he'd just stubbed his toe on a villainous coffee table. Raven stepped forward, her eyes glowing, ready to throw up a protective shield or something of that nature, but I breezed past her, a shadowy baseball bat materializing in my grip. Taking a batter's stance, I waited for his dark fastball to come zooming my way. With a swing worthy of the World Series, I sent it rocketing into the sky where it burst into a fireworks display of wriggling tentacles that seemed intent on molesting anything and everything within their reach. Touchdown for the good guys. I cheered, fist pumping like I'd just scored the winning goal. Brother Blood's frustration was practically visible as he morphed into a cloud of angry blood mist, zipping toward me faster than a squirrel chasing a nut. As he reformed before me, claws outstretched and ready for a manicure, or more likely to mangle my face, I threw up a shadowy barrier faster than you can say, abracadabra. Before he could blink, my hidden arsenal of apocalyptic blasters popped out of the shadows, aiming right at him. With a chorus of blasts that would make fireworks jealous, they unleashed their lasers and energy projectiles at Brother Blood. As the apocalyptic blasters unleashed their barrage, the air filled with the anguished scream of Brother Blood. A cloud of blood mist, riddled with holes like Swiss cheese, soared into the sky before coalescing back into Brother Blood's form, looking even angrier and more menacing somehow. Persistent little bugger isn't he? I remarked, eyeing Brother Blood's reformation with a mix of annoyance and intrigue. Raven, ever the master of understatement, chimed in with her usual dry tone. Brother Blood's cursed powers make him as resilient as a cockroach. It'll take more than a light breeze to keep him down. I shot her a glance, eyebrow raised in curiosity. So, what's the plan? I inquired. She nodded slowly, her expression serious. I have a spell in mind but it's complicated. I'll need a few minutes to pull it off, she explained. No problemo, I replied with a cocky grin, twirling the baseball bat in my hand until it transformed into a sleek blade. I'll keep the party going, but don't dawdle too much, I teased, activating my storm walker shoes and springing into the air, ready to take on Brother Blood once again. As I soared into the air, I caught Brother Blood's smirk, practically shouting, easy target up here. It was a classic villain move, but thankfully, he refrained from the cheesy dialogue small blessings, I guess. Undeterred, he ascended higher, raining down a storm of dark energy projectiles in my direction. I met his challenge head-on, conjuring shadowy platforms beneath my feet like a cosmic hopscotch game, dancing through the air to dodge his attacks. With each leap, I closed the gap between us, determined to keep the pressure on. Brother Blood's smug grin faltered, replaced by a look of frustration, but he didn't let up hurling even more projectiles and zipping around like a madman, trying to outpace me. I sliced through the incoming attacks with my sword, cutting them down like annoying flies. Whenever Brother Blood dipped too close to the ground, I summoned shadowy tendrils to ensnare him, but he proved to be slippery, slipping through my grasp with ease. As the aerial dance with Brother Blood continued, I glanced down to check on the other titans. Beast Boy had transformed into a dinosaur, engaged in a fierce tussle with Brother Blood's monstrous mount, while Starfire was busy keeping the acolytes at bay and protecting the civilians. 
lost in the momentary distraction, I felt the sudden presence of Brother Blood materializing before me. Before I could react, his extended nails were on a collision course with my face. Instead of panicking, I flashed him a grin as shadows began to swirl around me, revealing Radigan lunging from the darkness with a ferocious chitter. He sank his teeth into Brother Blood's nose and clawed at his face, eliciting a howl of pain. As Radigan withdrew, melding back into the shadows, I seized the opportunity, adjusting my stance and hurtling toward Brother Blood. With a swift stroke of my shadowy blade, I cleaved him in two. His body split apart, but instead of crumbling, it clung together with tendrils of blood mist, his fury evident even in his divided state. But I wasn't about to let up just yet. As I plummeted towards the ground like a particularly clumsy comet, I decided to give Brother Blood a taste of his own medicine. With a flick of my wrist, I unleashed a shadowy tendril that snatched him up like a kid grabbing the last slice of pizza at a birthday party. Brother Blood squirmed like a worm on a hook, trying to pull off some Houdini escape act with his blood mist trick, but my tendril had other plans. It expanded like a balloon, wrapping him up tighter than a burrito at a taco stand. With a dramatic spin worthy of a Hollywood action star, I sent him hurtling towards the pavement below. I followed suit, diving headfirst like a skydiver with a bad case of vertigo accompanied by the delightful symphony of apocalyptic blasters unleashing their barge from the shadows wreathing around my body. The landing was less than graceful, and I probably cracked a few bones, but, hey, who needs finesse when you've got style? I dusted myself off, metaphorically, because, you know, shadows, then conjured up a massive shadow hammer, ready to give Brother Blood's shadowy prison a good old-fashioned beatdown. I pounded away at the shadowy prison like a drummer on a caffeine high, but before I could make it into a rhythmic masterpiece, cracks started appearing, giving off this creepy red glow. Next thing I know, the shadows exploded, and out popped Brother Blood, looking like he'd just been through a blender. He gave me the stink eye and pulled out this weird red gem like it was his winning lottery ticket. You're a tough nut to crack, I'll give you that, he spat out, ready to launch into a speech that would probably put me to sleep faster than a lullaby. But I wasn't having it. Quick as a flash. I conjured up a shadowy bow and aimed straight for his arm, hoping to make him drop that gem like a hot potato. Brother Blood looked genuinely surprised and affronted at my interruption like I'd just crashed his tea party uninvited. But he reacted quickly, crushing the gem before the arrow hit its mark. Out of the crushed gem sprung this funky, blood-colored swirl, zipping straight into the mouth of Brother Blood's monstrous pet, currently having a rowdy tussle with Beast Boy in his Dino form. Suddenly, the creature let out a roar that could wake the dead, its body swelling up like a balloon on helium, and this eerie blood-colored fire dancing around it. Next thing I know, it casually grabs Beast Boy and tosses him into the nearest building like he weighed nothing, turning its attention to me. Well, shit. I grumbled to myself as the beast menacingly charged toward me, letting out a second roar that shattered all the glass in the area. Still, this is the perfect opportunity to try my new toy. With a sly grin, I dipped into my shadowy arsenal and whipped out my prized possession, the one decent thing I managed to snag from the evil clutches of the weapon gotcha. Chapter 59, Giant Slayer As I gripped the hilt of the sword, my body underwent an unexpected growth spurt, shooting me up to eye level with the towering infernal creature charging my way. Standing there, a whopping 32 feet tall, I couldn't help but feel a strange mix of awe and slight vertigo. But no time for existential crises now. The beast swung both its meaty fists down at me and I instinctively raised the sword to intercept its blow. As the creature's attack clashed against the blade, the details of my newfound weapon became clearer. It was a hefty two-handed sword, almost as tall as me at my regular height. The thing looked like it had seen more battles than an old warrior's memoirs. The hilt boasted intricate golden designs, a double cross guard gleaming with aged elegance. The blade itself was a worn grey, melding seamlessly with the cross guard, with crimson accents adorning both ends. Now. You're probably wondering how I suddenly became taller than a townhouse and capable of casually blocking a beast that looked like it bench-pressed cars for breakfast. Well, folks, that's all thanks to the sword's mystical mojo. Aptly named Giant Slayer, the sword sure lived up to its bold name. It packed a double punch of powers, too. First off, whenever I gripped it, my strength got a nice little boost, like a shot of adrenaline for my muscles. But the real kicker was its second power and by that I mean it doubled my natural strength. When facing off against anything on the extra-large menu, the sword would pull out its big guns, quite literally. It sized me up to match those big bats, doubling my height and strength each time. And let me tell you, 
it wasn't a one-time deal. Every time my size doubled from the original, so did my muscle power, and with my size ballooning like it was on a growth spurt, you can bet things got pretty intense. Now, you can imagine the scene unfolding. Back in his human form, Beast Boy popped up from under the rubble, staring at me like I was the main attraction at a circus. Starfire's eyes were practically sparkling with amazement, while Raven barely spared me a glance, too focused on her spellcasting to be bothered. And then there was Brother Blood, his face a colorful mix of rage and frustration, like a kid who just lost his favorite toy. As for his acolytes? Let's just say they looked like they'd seen a ghost, or in this case, a giant shadowy figure welding an equally gigantic sword. I wanted to soak up the reactions a little longer, but that hulking beast was relentless, matching my strength blow for blow and pushing me back into reality. With a wide grin, I tilted my sword just right, causing its massive fists to slide off like they were greased with butter, inadvertently smashing a car nearby into a pancake. I took a quick step back, raising my sword high and bringing it down hard on the beast's skull. Its response was a furious roar, and it raised its meaty hands to block the strike. But with all my newfound strength and weapon master skills, I stopped the blade just short of impact and gave it a good OL kick in the gut for good measure. The beast howled in agony, crashing flat onto its back. Seizing the moment, I summoned forth my shadowy powers, conjuring countless tendrils that snaked around the creature, pinning it to the ground like an unruly puppy. Stepping forward, I loomed over the thrashing beast and plunged my blade deep into its chest. Instead of blood, a dark energy gushed out from the wound like a water fountain, but I paid it no mind as I twisted and turned the blade, determined to put down the damned thing before it caused more damage. But just as I was getting into the groove of things, Brother Blood decided to crash the party, literally, as he morphed into his blood mist form and came barreling toward me. As Brother Blood materialized before me, his arm aimed like a sinister cannon ready to blast me with dark energy, I found myself faced with a split-second decision, do I drop the colossal beast and flick Brother Blood away like a pesky mosquito, or do I take one for the team and let his attack hit me to finish off the beast? Well, normally those would be the options, but in my current size, I had a more creative idea in mind, I pursed my lips in and prepared to spit at Brother Blood. Now, you might think it's a childish move, but given my current proportions, my spit could have downed him both literally and figuratively, disrupting his attack. But before I could execute my brilliant plan, Raven swooped in, floating between us with an air of authority. With a flick of her hands, she unleashed her magic, conjuring dark chains that snaked out toward Brother Blood like vengeful serpents. Return to the abyss from whence you came. She commanded, her voice crackling with arcane energy as the chains coiled around him. Brother Blood squirmed and cursed, struggling against his magical restraints, but Raven's spell held fast. As the chains tightened, they dragged Brother Blood toward the ground, weaving a swirling portal that looked like a direct ticket to hell. And honestly, given the circumstances, it might as well have been. Taking in the sight of Brother Blood getting dragged down to the fiery pits, I couldn't help but crack a grin. Enjoy your stay in eternal damnation, Grandpa. Maybe a few centuries down there will mellow you out, I jabbed, chuckling at the thought. Meanwhile, the monstrous infernal creature beneath me decided to call it quits, its struggles dwindling until it stopped moving altogether. Its body began to dissolve like foam exposed to acid, creating a scene that affronted all five senses with a godawful stench that ravaged my nostrils like that one uncle. The stench seemed to penetrate even beneath the wreathing shadows, eliciting a loud shrill protest filled with pure indignation and horror from Radigan. Thankfully, both the beast and its foul aroma quickly dissipated, leaving no trace behind. Witnessing the chaos they'd unleashed, the acolytes suddenly realized they were in way over their heads and scattered like cockroaches fleeing from a light switch. Raven, ever vigilant, activated her powers, summoning dark energy chains that wrapped around the fleeing followers before they could make a getaway. The effort seemed to drain her, though, as she began to collapse to the ground. Instinctively, I moved to catch her, but I quickly halted my actions as I noticed a flash of green bolting toward her. Beast Boy swooped in just in time, cradling her in his arms before she hit the ground. I couldn't help but smirk at the sight, withholding a chuckle as I mentally applauded Beast Boy's heroics with a thumbs up. Ah, young love. I'm almost envious. I mused. It was the perfect opportunity to make an impression and harvest more points, but I wasn't so heartless as to steal Beast Boy's thunder. He was one of those characters, who suffered too much for absolutely no reason, and he definitely deserved the semblance of a happy ending. As the adrenaline rush subsided, my body began to shrink back to its normal size now that the immediate threat was gone. 
the distant wail of sirens reminded me of the inevitable arrival of the tardy police force. Well, it was nice meeting you all, but it's time I left you lovebirds, and took my leave, I announced, prompting Beast Boy to release his grip on Raven, both of them sporting a charming blush. Adorable. C.A., I waved casually, conjuring a shadowy stepping platform beneath my feet, ready to make my exit. But before I could leap away, Starfire appeared before me, arms outstretched. Wait! She exclaimed, spreading her arms apart as if to stop me from leaving. What is your name? She asked with a strange expression I couldn't quite point out. I shrugged, offering a friendly smile. Micah Foster, but like I said, I gotta leave, so see you later, princess, I replied, bounding into the air before she could respond. Chapter 60, Yolanda Montes Lounging in a cozy corner of a local cafe, I observed Radigan indulging in a rigorous grooming session, his tiny paws meticulously tending to each whisker. Meanwhile, my attention drifted to the glowing screen of my phone, where I perused the latest news updates. From drug cartels running amok to terrorist groups popping up like daisies, it seemed the world was in dire need of a hero. Or at least someone to shake things up a bit. But alas, nothing caught my eye as a worthy point-harvesting endeavor, leaving me pondering the perplexities of my superhero downtime. With Livewire's impending release looming on the horizon, I anticipated a crash course in electricity manipulation and media management. Teaching her the ropes should be electrifying, to say the least. Yet, until Livewire's debut electrified the airwaves, my schedule was as barren as a desert. As for Mr. Freeze, I'd entrusted him with the father box, since he's had more than enough time to reflect on his misguided attempt to rob me. I wasn't worried about him double-crossing me since I installed a special bug I bought from the system into the father box, but that's neither here nor there. I had grand plans to rework Freeze's public image, but they couldn't be implemented until I had my company up and running. Sure, I'd done my due diligence on the paperwork required to launch a company, but that was where my expertise ended. Running a business was as foreign to me as deciphering ancient hieroglyphics. Plus, without a killer product or service up my sleeve, I was about as useful as a chocolate teapot at a tea party. Pondering my options for a business venture, I tapped my chin thoughtfully as I sipped my coffee. Mr. Freeze's technology seemed like a promising starting point. I mean, who wouldn't want gadgets straight out of a cryogenic lab? With a bit of brainstorming, we could whip up something sure to fly off the shelves. And if all else failed, there was always the option to splurge on some cutting-edge tech from the system and let Freeze work his reverse engineering magic. The guy was a certified genius, after all. As for the face of this budding enterprise, I had a few names swirling around in my head. Azrael, a.k.a. Jean Paul Valley, topped the list. He owed me one already, and he proved his worth thanks to his role in securing Livewire's parole. But, as talented as he was, running a business wasn't exactly his forte. Plus, there was only so much one man could handle. Then there was Barbara Gordon. A real brainiac no doubt, but her penchant for poking her nose into everything made her a risky bet. Not to mention, I'd never even met her, so convincing her to jump aboard would be a Herculean task. Lastly there was Albert Weskier. You might be scratching your head, wondering who the heck that is. Well, let me jog your memory. Remember the ventriloquist? Yeah, that guy strapped to an operation table in Arxham, with Harley Quinn ready to give him a jab of who knows what with a cartoon-sized needle. Good times good times. But hey, thanks to the wonders of modern psychiatry courtesy of one Joan Leland that chapter of his life is firmly in the rearview mirror. Now, don't let the whole puppet on his hand thing fool you. Sure, he used to terrorize Gotham with a wooden sidekick, but these days, he's turned a new leaf. And let me tell you, the man's got talent. It takes some serious brain power to convince a bunch of Gotham's toughest thugs to do your bidding, especially with some goofy puppet in your hand doing the talking. Running a gang might not be your typical business venture, but hey, leadership is leadership, and business skills are business skills, right? If he can give Batman a run for his money, imagine what he could do in the corporate world with some study. Besides, Wes Seeker's status as a reformed villain made him just perfect. Considering I had plans to reform and use I mean to employ a bunch of criminals, what better example to set for the world than a reformed criminal running a successful company? Finishing off my coffee, I leaned back in my seat putting away my phone as I pondered my next move. The system's interface glowed invitingly, offering me a plethora of options to stave off the boredom that threatened to engulf me. Maybe triggering another quest could shake things up a bit. 
I mused, browsing through the Intel options. Before I could dive into that rabbit hole, my phone decided to chime in with its own agenda. With a raised eyebrow, I answered the call from Ted, aka Wildcat, my kinda mentor and friend in this chaotic world. Hey, kiddo, Ted's gravelly voice crackled through the line. Listen, I need you to do me a big favor. I didn't hesitate to offer my assistance. Ted had been there for me since day one, or was it day two? Anyway, I owed him much and had no reason to refuse. Sure thing, Ted. What's up? I responded, already mentally preparing to head over to the gym where he trained me. It's kind of a big deal not something to discuss over the phone. Can you swing by the gym? Ted requested. Without missing a beat, I replied, on my way. With Radigan, perched comfortably on my shoulder, I settled the bill and made my way out the door, ready to see what Ted had in store for me. Leaning against the wall of Ted Grant's office, Yolanda Montez wore a slight frown as she regarded her mentor and godfather. Her auburn eyes fixed on Ted, the man who had become like a second father to her. With a proud lineage as the daughter of Juan Montez, a professional boxer, Yolanda had inherited her father's strength and determination. Over the years, she grew especially close to Ted, going as far as to take his mantle and becoming the second wildcat when he suffered a debilitating injury in days past. She had come a long way since then, carving her own path as a hero. From her days with Infinity, into her solo adventures, and now her involvement with the Shadow Fighters, Yolanda had faced her fair share of challenges. Yet, it was the looming mission ahead with the Shadow Fighters that had brought her to Ted's office today, seeking his help with a sense of foreboding clouding her thoughts. However, her hopes were quickly dashed as Ted explained that he had prior commitments with his old Justice Society comrades, a matter concerning an old threat re-emerging. Disappointed but understanding, Yolanda listened as Ted assured her that he knew just the person to assist her and promptly made a call. Caught in her thoughts, Yolanda snapped back to reality as the young man strolled into the office. He blended into the background with his unassuming features, standing at an average height like a regular Joe with a lean build. Still, there was something about the easy grin etched on his face that hinted at a depth beyond the ordinary. His gaze swept the room, the rat perched on his shoulder mimicking his movements. So, what's up, Ted? He asked, his tone relaxed yet attentive. Yolanda's skepticism lingered as she observed the young man. He was Micah, the protege of Ted spoke so highly of, who had somehow managed to best him in a sparring match despite his relatively short training. Trusting Ted's judgment about Micah's abilities, she still harbored doubts about his willingness to assist in the dangerous mission ahead. Thanks for showing up on such short notice, kiddo, Ted greeted, giving Micah a nod of appreciation. Let me introduce you too. Micah, meet Yolanda Montez, my goddaughter. She's the second wildcat and a member of the Shadow Fighters, he explained, gesturing towards Yolanda. Yolanda inwardly sighed at Ted's casual revelation of her secret identity. Still, she brushed off her concerns about Micah leaking her secret, knowing Ted wouldn't have brought him in if he couldn't be trusted. Micah flashed a grin at Yolanda and approached her. The name's Micah Foster. A pleasure to meet you, miss, he said offering his hand for a handshake. Yolanda's grip was firm as she shook Micah's hand, reciprocating his greeting with a simple likewise. After a few solid shakes, Micah released her hand, his attention returning to Ted. So, I'm guessing Miss Montez here has something to do with the favor you want to ask me, Ted. His head tilted inquisitively as he spoke, his casual demeanor contrasting with the seriousness of the situation. Ted nodded, acknowledging the accuracy of Micah's assumption. You're absolutely right, Ted confirmed. Take a seat, will you, kiddo? It'll take a while to explain, he suggested, gesturing towards an empty chair nearby, his tone tinged with a sense of urgency. Chapter 61, Fishy Operation Yolanda took charge, her voice ringing with authority as she outlined the mission details. All right, here's the deal. We're teaming up with the Office of Meta-Human Affairs and some other top-secret government group, she began her tone a mix of seriousness and urgency. Our target? A nasty piece of work known as the Count. He's got a stranglehold on Parador, and we're going in to take him down. Micah cocked an eyebrow, his interest peaked. And what's the situation on the ground? He asked, his voice betraying a hint of skepticism. Yolanda met his gaze head on, her expression firm. Not bad, actually. Four government agents infiltrated Parador to gather intel, but they got nabbed by the Count, she explained, her tone tinged with frustration. 
During their capture they figured out this guy's been spiking his drugs with poison. Real nasty stuff. She continued, her words flowing with a sense of urgency. The Count decided it'd be fun to release our agents into the forest bordering Brazil to have them hunted down by his men. Lucky for us, they managed to slip away. Micah nodded, processing the information. So, what's the situation now? He asked, his demeanor calm and collected. Yolanda's gaze hardened, her determination shining through. Bruce Gordon, the big shot in charge of this OP, sees the Count slip up as a sign of weakness, she explained, her voice tinged with resolve. He's rallying the troops, gearing up for what seems like an easy takedown. But I've got a gut feeling that things won't be that easy. She glanced at Ted briefly before locking eyes with Micah once more. That's where Ted, or you come in. We need all the help we can get to make sure this mission goes off without a hitch. Micah's skepticism hung heavy in the air, his gaze probing as he questioned Yolanda's assessment of the situation. So, why would this ruthless drug lord let potential threats slip through his fingers? Sounds suspicious, don't you think? He queried, his tone laced with doubt. Yolanda's brow furrowed at the unexpected scrutiny. She had expected Micah to either agree to join the mission or refuse, not question the logic of her superiors. Glancing at Ted for support, she found him wearing a nonchalant expression, leaving her to face Micah's scrutiny alone. Turning back to Micah, she decided to offer her perspective. Maybe he gets a kick out of it, or he's flexing his muscle to show he's still in control. Who knows? She replied, her tone defensive. Micah chuckled, shaking his head in amusement. I think you're underestimating this Count character too much, he remarked, his skepticism apparent. You think a drug dealer who has taken over a whole country would risk blowing his cover for a little amusement? Seems unlikely. Before Yolanda could respond, Micah pressed on, his words deliberate. Sure, drug lords tend to be ruthless, but none of them is dumb there's a thing called selective ruthlessness that such people employ. He continued, his tone matter-of-fact, they know exactly when to make a spectacle or when to take care of things on the sly, understanding the limits of their forces almost perfectly, they wouldn't survive for long otherwise. Yolanda's expression turned pensive as she mulled over Micah's words. So, you're suggesting he's not foolish enough to expose himself like that, hey? Then why did the Count do all of that? She mused aloud, her tone laced with uncertainty. Micah's chuckle filled the room, his demeanor relaxed despite the seriousness of the conversation. I have no idea what this guy is plotting, but it feels like a classic case of a wolf pretending to be a sheep, he explained, his voice tinged with conviction. I'm sorry, but the way I see it, you've all been dancing to his tune without even realizing it, he added, shaking his head in disbelief. Yolanda's features contorted with a mix of realization and dismay. I can't believe we overlooked that possibility, she admitted, her frustration evident. And what do you suggest we do then? Sit back and let him continue spreading his drugs and poison. She questioned, the tension palpable in her voice. Micah's expression turned incredulous as if he couldn't believe the question was even asked. It's simple, really. Get the Justice League involved. The government bigwigs should have some leverage over the capes, no. He suggested, his tone matter of fact. And if you want to outsmart this guy, have the League's heavy hitters on standby, ready to swoop in when he shows his hand, he concluded, his confidence unwavering as if he could see the future. Yolanda paused, her brow furrowing in contemplation. That's a bit. She muttered with a hesitant sigh. The Office of Meta-Human Affairs and other government teams were set up specifically to reduce dependence on the Justice League. It won't sit well with the higher UPS to ask for their help, she explained, shaking her head at the predicament. Micah's response was blunt, sending a shiver down Yolanda's spine. Then you've got two options, convince Waller and her crew to swallow their pride and seek league aid, or kiss your chances of survival goodbye, he stated matter-of-factly, his words landing like a heavyweight in the room. Yolanda's eyes widened in disbelief at the dire ultimatum. How do you even know about Amanda Waller? She blurted out, her gaze darting between Ted and Micah, seeking answers. Before Micah could respond, Ted intervened offering a vague explanation. Micah's from a parallel universe seems to have a knack for knowing things, he explained with a shrug, though his tone hinted at a deeper understanding. Micah's smile held a hint of mystery as he brushed off the question. How I know about Waller isn't important. What matters is your survival, he emphasized, his voice firm and unwavering. And the way I see it, unless you've got a real heavy hitter watching your back, 
you're not making it back alive. Ted's expression softened as he regarded Micah with a curious gaze. You seemed pretty heavy-hitting when you dealt with that cultist lunatic and his pet monster. Why not step up to the plate? He suggested a note of encouragement in his voice. Micah's scoff betrayed his reluctance. I may play the part occasionally, but I'm no hero, Ted, he responded, his tone dismissive yet tinged with an underlying determination. I'm just a guy trying to make his mark on the world. I love you, and you know it, but I won't risk my life walking into an obvious trap, he asserted firmly. Instead of showing disappointment or frustration, Ted merely chuckled at Micah's words. You heard him, kiddo, he said, turning his gaze to Yolanda. Micah owes me a lot, but not his life, and he's been pretty helpful with his insights, he added, his expression turning more serious. This entire situation stinks to high hell, and I'd think twice before trusting the likes of Waller and Sarge Steele if I were you, he concluded, his tone weighted with caution. Yolanda lowered her gaze deep in contemplation. However, Ted's words seemed to have sparked something in Micah's mind. Who are they sending to Peridor alongside you, by the way? Micah interjected, breaking Yolanda's chain of thought. I may not look it, but I'm pretty clever, you know? If I know who's going, I might be able to help come up with a plan, he suggested a hint of determination in his voice. Yolanda hesitated for a moment before relenting, deciding to trust Micah with classified information. Commander Steele, Peacemaker, The Creeper, Major Victory, Manhunter, Dr. Midnight, Chunk, Simon Bennett, Will Magnus, and Nemesis, she listed off the names. Micah's brow furrowed as he absorbed the information, letting out an exasperated sigh. Other than Peacemaker and Nemesis, I've never heard of any of the others, he admitted, turning to Ted, who shook his head, silently conveying he hadn't heard of them either. If this was such an important mission, why wouldn't Waller rely on her prized suicide squad instead of a group of third-rate vigilantes, no offense, he added, his tone meaningful as if suggesting something deeper. Yolanda's expression looked even more shocked than before. How do you even know about the suicide squad? She asked, her curiosity piqued. Micah replied with a simple shrug. Let's just say I've picked up a thing or two along the way, he said, a hint of mystery in his tone. Still, now that you mention it, I've never thought of why Waller brought together such a team of ragtag vigilantes just to take down this Count character. Yolanda mused, her tone growing more thoughtful with each word as if she was on the verge of realizing something profound. Something is clearly up. I'd start by looking into that Bruce Gordon fellow to get to the bottom of it if I were you, Micah suggested, his gaze drifting towards the door as if eager to leave the whole situation behind. Actually, no, scratch that, he continued waving off the idea with a dismissive flick of his hand. If I were you, I'd just wash my hands of the entire situation and leave, just as I'm about to do now. Later, Ted, he added, rising from his seat and making his way towards the exit, much to Ted's amusement. Later, kiddo, Ted called after him, a grin spreading across his face as he watched Micah depart. Chapter 62, Detective Work Lounging in the public library, scrolling through the internet, I couldn't help but roll my eyes at the sad state of Dr. Midnight's fan page. It was like a digital ghost town, maintained by a guy who probably had a shrine dedicated to her in his closet. Poor Dr. Midnight, she deserved better, but hey, at least she had infrared vision, right? Not exactly a superpower that lights up the room. As for the other heroes on Yolanda's list, they were all hanging out in the same pit of obscurity. It was like the island of misfit superheroes. And to think these were the folks supposedly on a mission to save the world. Talk about sacrificial goats. I mean, come on, DC Comics was supposed to be this dark, gritty world where anyone could kick the bucket at any moment. But let's be real, they couldn't just off the popular money cows like Superman or Batman like it was no big deal. Well, they did off them from time to time, but they'd bring them back faster than you could say comic book resurrection. So what's a writer to do to maintain the dark, unforgiving charade? Cook up a bunch of forgettable characters, and when the time's right, gather them up and toss them into some tragic fate. It's like the comic book equivalent of Russian roulette, and that's exactly what's happening here. I was now 99% sure none of these obscure vigilantes would make it back alive if they went to Parador, including Yolanda Montes herself. Now, you might be scratching your head wondering why a comic book aficionado like myself was suddenly playing detective. Well, let me tell you. My comic book consumption was strictly limited to the A-listers back in the day. 
I didn't waste my precious time on the B-Squad, let alone the Z-Team. Who wants to invest brain cells in characters just waiting for their inevitable demise? But hey, desperate times call for desperate measures, right? So there I was, diving into the deep end of the internet, digging up dirt on this Count character. And let me tell you, he was a real piece of work. He started off as your run-of-the-mill drug dealer, and then, bam. Suddenly he's the puppet master pulling the strings in Parador, with more power than the actual government. If that doesn't scream red flag, I don't know what does. I mean, let's be real, folks don't just stumble into power like that with a stroke of luck. It's like winning the lottery twice in a row. Nat, there had to be something fishy going on behind the scenes. Maybe the Count had a secret benefactor or heck maybe he's got some evil mastermind pulling the strings from the shadows. This ain't your grandma's bedtime story, this is DC Comics, where every twist has a twist. But then again, maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe the Count's just the clever, scheming type. But considering his track record of arrests and failed prison breakouts, that seems about as likely as finding a unicorn at the bottom of a cereal box. So far, we've had a group of sacrificial pawns and a hidden mastermind pulling the Count's strings. And just when I thought the plot couldn't thicken any further, in swoops Bruce Gordon, Earth's resident solar energy guru, with a rap sheet longer than my grocery list. I mean, talk about a guy with a knack for attracting trouble. Gordon's life reads like a soap opera script on steroids. Criminal groups? Check. Government shoddiness? Double check. And let's not forget the cherry on top, a father-in-law who gets off in the most gruesome cartel-style hit this side of a Quentin Tarantino movie. But here's the kicker, right around the time O.L. Pops in law bites the dust, the Count had just finished wrapping his mittens around the figurative neck of Parador. Coincidence? I think not. This smells fishier than a seafood market on a hot summer day. Now, call me crazy, but I don't believe in coincidences, especially not in the DC universe. So when a drug lord suddenly decides to set his sights on Bruce Gordon's family, someone he didn't even know existed before, it's like waving a giant neon sign that says, something's fishy here, folks. So, let's connect the dots here. We've got the Count, who's climbing the villainous ladder faster than a cat up a curtain, targeting Bruce Gordon the solar energy maestro. But then, plot twist, the Count gives Gordon a get-out-of-jail-free card when he's got him in his clutches. Strange, right? Why would a bad guy with a one-way ticket to the top give his arch-nemesis a chance to slip through his fingers like a greased pig? It's like inviting your worst enemy to a game of hide-and-seek and then telling them exactly where you're hiding. Now, if we toss in Yolanda's tidbit about the Count playing cat and mouse with Gordon, only to let him scamper away, the whole thing starts to smell fishier than a sushi joint on a summer's day. It's like the Count's playing 40 chess while the rest of them are stuck on checkers. So, who's pulling the strings behind the curtain? Some shady oil tycoons afraid of losing their monopoly over the energy industry due to Gordon's solar energy research? Maybe. But would such people really need to bankroll the Count's rise to power just to take out Gordon? It seems like a bit of overkill, doesn't it? And if the Count's puppeteer had it out for Gordon from day one, why give him a chance to play Houdini and escape? So, here's the headache-inducing, brain-busting summary of my mental gymnastics, the Count's got a mastermind behind the curtain, pulling his strings like a puppet. This puppeteer's got a serious bone to pick with Bruce Gordon, but for some reason, they're playing a game of cat and mouse instead of just going for the jugular. First off, they lure Gordon into the lion's den by offing his father-in-law. Then, they nab him but let him slip through their fingers like a wet bar of soap. And get this they let him escape with the knowledge that could bring the whole house of cards crashing down around the Count's pointy ears, the fact that his drugs are about as safe as a cocktail of arsenic and cyanide. Now, why on earth would someone go through all that trouble just to give Gordon a fighting chance? Well, it's like this, Gordon's no ordinary Joe. He's the solar energy guru, the top dog in a field that's got some shadowy figure shaking in their boots. And that's where it gets real juicy. Why would someone be sweating bullets over solar power? It's not exactly the kind of thing that keeps most people up at night. That's the million dollar question, and right now, I'm about as clueless as a goldfish in a shark tank. The answer to this conundrum was with Bruce Gordon and his solar tech, but with the internet hitting a dead end, I figured it was time to pull out the big guns. So, I whipped out my trusty phone and dialed up Azrael faster than a speed dialing champ. He wasted no time picking up, and I got straight to the point. Hey, Jean. I need you to do me a solid real quick, I said, 
cutting to the chase. Azrael, always up for an adventure, gave me the green light. Shoot, what do you need? Bruce Gordon. I need the inside scoop on him, the juicy details you won't find on some random website. If you've got access to any top-secret government databases, now's the time to work your magic, I requested. Azrael let out a chuckle, promising to put his detective skills to good use. A minute later, he was back with the goods. According to the GCPD database, Bruce Gordon had teamed up with the dynamic duo Batman and Commissioner Gordon to take down a rising gang leader in Gotham. That's the best I've got for now, but give me some more time, and I might uncover more, Azrael offered. No need to break a sweat. Just give me the name of the thug they were after, I replied. Azrael wasted no time and dropped the name, Johnny Malone. Thanks, Jean. I owe you one, I said, ending the call and diving straight into a search for this Johnny Malone character. Another thug on the rise, and Gordon's mixed up in it. Yeah, call me skeptical, but I smell a setup from a mile away. Chapter 63, Case Cracked Lounging on the plush couch in Penguin's office at the Iceberg Lounge, I couldn't resist an eye roll at the sight of the man himself, playing kingpin while overlooking his club's bustling patrons through the massive office window. He was giving me the cold shoulder, acting like I was invisible. Classic Oswald. Now, why was I here, you ask? Well, I'd been digging into this Johnny Malone character, and it seemed like his existence was shrouded in mystery online. It was as if someone had gone to great lengths to erase his digital footprint. But who cares about online records when you've got the Penguin's ear, right? Malone's gang had tangled with Penguin's crew among others before biting the dust, so I figured the Penguin might have some insights. Getting into the Iceberg Lounge and scoring an audience with Gotham's underworld maestro wasn't too tricky this time around. We were already acquaintances, after all. Yet, there he was, doing his whole speak first and you lose routine, like we were playing some twisted game of verbal chess. The unspoken message hung in the air know your place. Or something to that effect, at least. Penguin had a knack for making his point without saying a word. Ordinarily, I'd happily play the waiting game until he got arthritis or died of old age, but today I was on a mission, and the Penguin only responded to one thing, respect. Thirty minutes of silence should be enough of a gesture. Good evening, Mr. Cobblepot, I greeted, rising from the couch and strolling over to him. Enjoying the view, as usual. I threw in with a grin peering down at the iceberg's lively patrons. Penguin gave me a sideways glance, playing up the act of surprise. Oh? It's you, kid. He drawled, feigning innocence. When did you even get here? He inquired, giving me the once-over. Just arrived, actually, I replied with a grin as if I hadn't spent the past thirty minutes lounging on his couch and pilfering the snack tray. I'm here to ask you about someone, I continued. Penguin nodded gesturing for us to have a seat and get down to business. As he turned toward his desk, his eyes landed on the now empty snack table, and a flicker of irritation crossed his face. I barely stifled a laugh at his reaction. While he was busy putting on airs, Radigan and I were busy indulging in his tea and snacks. Ha! Huh. But Penguin quickly composed himself and settled behind his desk. Tell me what you need, but remember, information comes at a price, he reminded me motioning for me to take a seat opposite him. I'm in the market for some top-secret intel on Johnny Malone, I began, leaning in slightly. You know, small-time crook turned kingpin had a few run-ins with Gotham's gangs until Batman and Commissioner Gordon put an end to his little reign of terror? Does any of that ring any bells? I prodded, watching for any telltale signs of recognition in Penguin's demeanor. Penguin's expression twitched at the mention of Malone, but he quickly masked his reaction. And what business would you have with a washed-up upstart rotting in Blackgate? He shot back, his gaze sharpening. Normally, I'd tell Penguin to mind his own business, but I knew there was a chance to strike a deal here. The Penguin had a reputation for holding grudges, and if I could help him settle one, he might just give me the information I needed without asking for a hefty fee. It's not Malone himself that's got my attention, but rather the puppet master pulling his strings, I clarified. I've reasons to believe this mastermind is pulling similar stunts over in Parador, using a guy they call the Count as their pawn, I added. Penguin's interest was piqued by my words. And what's your evidence for this theory? He inquired, his tone sharpening. I'd be happy to share, but you know how it goes, valuable information doesn't come cheap, I countered, raising an eyebrow. 
you're not expecting me to give away the goods for free after laying down the law, are you? I remarked, feigning innocence. Much to my surprise, Penguin leaned back in his chair, a smug smile curling on his lips as he leisurely reached for an expensive-looking cigar and lit it up. Fair enough, he drawled, exhaling a cloud of smoke that seemed to linger in the air like a foreboding mist. Well, color me shocked. I half expected the penguin to bring up the freebie he gave me and whip out his fine-toothed comb to start haggling like a bargain-hungry ant at a flea market. It's official. The penguin is a surprisingly decent guy if you know how to deal with him. We'll trade info then, he continued, smoke rings dancing around his head like sinister halos. However, you'll have to take the plunge first. You did enjoy a little freebie last time you paid me a visit, he added with a smirk that could rival the Cheshire Cats. Scratch that he's back to being the worst. Well, fine by me. Playing show intel wasn't exactly a foreign concept. Besides, if the penguin promised intel, he'd better deliver, or I'd have to start rethinking my choice in underworld confidence. Sure thing, Mr. Cobblepot your house, your rules, I shrugged, adopting a nonchalant tone that belied the anxious butterflies fluttering in my stomach. Here's the lowdown, Bruce Gordon, Solar Energy Whiz has a thing for nosing into the affairs of budding drug lords, I began, hoping to pique the penguin's interest. He was there with Batman when Malone bit the dust, and now he's got Uncle Sam's blessing to take down the Count, I explained. Too many dots connecting Malone and the Count for it to be mere coincidence, I concluded, leaning back and waiting for Penguin's reaction. As the penguin mulled over my words, his fingers drummed a slow rhythm against the tabletop, a thoughtful expression crossing his face like a storm cloud brewing over Gotham. Now that you mention it. Bruce Gordon there was indeed a blip on the radar around the time Malone started making waves, he mused, his gaze fixed on some invisible puzzle. He vanished quicker than a magician's rabbit the moment Malone was slapped in cuffs before the GCPD could even get a whiff of him, he added, snuffing out his cigar in the ashtray with a deft flick of his wrist. Close enough for government work, he concluded with a nod. I couldn't help but grin at his words. So, any juicy tidbits on Malone? If it's you, I wouldn't be surprised if you knew who the mastermind is already. I inquired, leaning forward with a mix of curiosity and flattery in my voice. Buttering up the penguin was a necessary evil, like trying to charm a snake. Who knows, maybe a little sweet talk would coax out some hidden gem from his treasure trove of information. Or so I hoped. With Penguin's connections and influence in Gotham City, uncovering the mastermind behind Malone didn't seem like such a stretch, but knowing my rotten luck. Sure enough, the penguin's response was a disappointing shake of his head. As much as I'd like to claim otherwise, I'm afraid I'm in the dark about this mastermind's identity, despite my best efforts, he admitted with a resigned shrug. I've got next to Zilch on Malone himself nothing you couldn't dig up on your own, he added, gesturing towards the laptop perched on his desk. But I do have this, he announced, his fingers dancing across the keyboard as the ceiling split open, revealing a massive screen descending from above like some high-tech gift from the heavens. With a deft tap of the penguin's fingers on the keyboard, the massive screen sprang to life, casting a glow across the dimly lit room. A grainy video played out before us, featuring a man in a sharp suit who suddenly materialized within the iceberg lounge. But the real show began when he levitated into the air, unleashing dark energy blasts from his outstretched hand, dispatching the penguin's henchmen like bowling pins in a strike as a strange grey mark materialized on his face, covering the rightmost third of it. As I watched the chaos unfold on screen, a light bulb flickered to life in my mind. So, I'm guessing Malone wasn't exactly the float in the air and blast people with mystery beams kind of guy before he climbed the ladder of influence. I remarked, turning to the penguin for confirmation, and he nodded in agreement. And all that flying mojo and magic blasts vanished into thin air once he was cuffed. I pressed on, receiving another affirmative nod. Those simple nods confirmed my suspicions, and I was about 99% sure I had just cracked the case of our elusive mastermind. Yet, instead of feeling the rush of victory one might expect from solving such a mystery, all I felt was a gnawing sense of unease. This is even worse than I expected. I muttered, rubbing my forehead in frustration. Thanks for listening.